Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. It's, what is this? Unspun episode number 132. We are doing the roots of antinomian music tonight with Dr. Hans Otter. Hans, welcome back. Hey, Jan, it's great to see you. Yeah. We had a lot of here. had a lot of material last week. We didn't uh, have a chance to cover it all. This was going to be sort of a part two, but it's sort of not. Also, it's under a totally different title. So uh, anyway, welcome to the show. I suppose we have a lot of material to cover. We always do. So we should probably just dig in. Huh? Oh, and I should say thanks for all the support and donations and uh, my heart goes out to my sister and uh, her family and everybody up in Northern California who lost their homes in the fire. Uh, it's been a rough week for her family and uh, anyway, so and lots of other people's families. So it hit close to home this time, <clears throat> you know, and I've been evacuated from here. I, this is a wood cabin in the mountains. And I've been evacuated from here before in uh, 2003. We were evacuated for a week from the old fire, which at the time was the largest fire in California or U.S. history. But um, anyway, let's uh, dig in and uh, let's hit the ground running here. All right, Jan, that's great. You know, I my mind just went blank. I totally forgot what the show was about. I, I'm just kidding. Don't worry. <laughs> it's been a long day. And uh, last show I was... I had been sick for about two weeks and I realized that it seemed like I just done like a eight ball or something. So that wasn't the case. I actually, uh -huh. was <laughs> Oh yeah. That's what I do. Yeah. Before I go on unspun, I go, I go, <laughs> you get spun, <laughs> you get spun you know, before you go on unspun. I, ironically enough, um, this house that I live in, right. It was actually owned by a guy that ran a drug cartel, a Mexican guy. And he had these uh, front, grocery stores right and they were but then the whole like like the studio i'm in now the entire thing was mirrors you know walled ceiling everywhere so i've got a lot of mirrors anybody wants some mirrors uh i'm not sure why i brought that up but uh there you go all right tmi hans blame the uh blame the drug cartel guy yeah oh yeah <laughs> his, his his spirit yeah he's watching me yeah <laughs> just like alice cooper now the fact was that uh <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I'm going to be, this is sort of the basis, right? For Alice what Cooper's, I was talking about. Uh, ritual uh, sacrifice of the goyim with the chicken. Yeah. Well, no, this is, uh, I wanted to provide a little more of a scientific basis and uh, culturally uh, sound as well as looking at actually mechanisms uh, for this stuff. So I just, I, I, my examples this week, I'm going to be looking at a lot of uh, classical music. Uh, avant-garde uh, from uh, uh, solely actually and I just didn't want to list any more Alice Cooper I I uh, I'm a boy and I'm a man I mean that line it actually got stuck in my head after that show it was like the, the oh, ghost no. of Alice Cooper cursing me it was just it wouldn't stop I mean I was it was um, I'm sorry to hear that yeah, it was, it so was did rough. you start getting confused if you were a boy or a man? <laughs> no, you know, I, I it never really had that. Uh, you know, I, I never really had that thought never came in my mind. Like I just thought in my life, I never thought I'm a boy, but I'm a man. You know, I, it, uh, you know, I it just didn't, uh, you know, you know, this thing is kind of interesting. I'm just going to jump ahead. Music, musicogenic epilepsy. It's a, it's a phenomenon, right? Where people hear certain songs, they actually go in, they have epileptic seizures, they have like intense anxiety, and it's usually like one single song. And people have actually committed suicide, they've actually murdered people from this disorder. But only, uh, at least there's like 76 cases, maybe, you know, 80 or 90. So, but I, I felt like when I was looking into that, I said, man, Alice, I love you guy. You know, let's hang out. Let's hang out and golf. We can go golfing and uh, talk about this stuff. But um, yeah, and by the way, I do appreciate support. Um, you know, I do I do put a lot of time and you know coming up. Give with this out stuff. your uh, address and emails so people can throw you some donations and you know okay. throw up some super chats for me too, folks. Please. It's uh, Hans Utter at hotmail dot com. It's my name, and uh, you, you just you can reach me at Folsom Prison. Just. <laughs> All right. It's Northern California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've uh, 
I've been there. Well, I've, I haven't been there. I've, I've seen it <laughs> from the outside, man, not from the inside. Okay. Not yet. Okay. So let's just get into it. Antinomian. What does that mean? Uh, I'm sure people are familiar with that. If you're not familiar with it, it's a term that means a type of a movement, a process can be a religious process, a cultural process. It's generally, it's a movement, right? You, you don't have a single person that's antinomian. For example, uh, you know, the, um, the Burning Man could be described in a certain way as antinomian festival, even though it kind of is, but it basically means disrupting, you know, the norms. Uh, and also, in a sense, there's an idea of destabilizing the order in whatever particular field that is. And in this case, you know, we're gonna look a little more detail about music. It's a little more dense tonight. Um, I don't know why I like to hurt myself, but, um, you know, so look into how this and, is, and it's going to be under an hour too. Is it? Oh no. Okay. I'm, I'm just, you know, just psyching the audience out, you know, I, I was, yeah, and I was, uh, I, I'm trying not to talk so fast. I heard the last show back. I'm like, man, <laughs> that's why I made that joke in the beginning. It's, it's like, I was really talking fast and I thought I was talking quite slowly because I was so sick, but I guess that was the, quadruple espresso that I had before the show. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so we look at, first of all, we have, we had the examples last week, right? So this is sort of a backstory, as well as supporting arguments, as well as expanding the picture uh, in a much more broad way. Um, one thing about both Mr. Alice Cooper and the music I'll be talking about tonight, except for, uh, by the way, I have a concert tomorrow so I, I i may play some sitar before i start doing the music examples just to uh just because i feel like it but also i want to you know i just i have to practice we get the, we get the personal the uh personal upfront uh front row uh concert here huh well it's not gonna i mean i have i'm gonna be holding the sitar like this and try not to make any uh right rock star faces you know yeah well you know <laughs> but uh, you don't want to look I, like alice cooper now no, I don't. Um, it, there's somebody that. Uh, Do you sacrifice some, chickens before the the show to mock the goyim? Uh, no, I don't. I, I have yet to do that. Uh, you know, I. You know, I just they just reminded me of this this guy who was. Uh, you know, he just I don't know if he was a critic. I did this concert. He's like, you know, he said, "Do you study acting?" He's like, "No." He's like, "I really understood the music through your facial expressions. I realized you work so hard to make those expressions." I'm like, "Dude, I'm just playing the music. I don't know what I'm doing." <laughs> I don't know if that was a, a like a knife in the back from the from the critic, but anyways, let's start with a quote it sounds, from. It sounds like when my mom used to talk about my the the faces I would make when I was a little boy when I was coloring, you know. <laughs> when you were coloring, yeah, you'd have been an artist, man. Yeah, you're the next Pablo Picasso. <laughs> All right, um, so this is a quote from Paul Henry Lang, uh, musicologist, scholar, writing, you know, sort of in the early 19th, uh, 20th century. Quote. New life could be infused into the music of this rapidly disintegrating world only by an even more nervous, sophisticated, and surcharged emphasis on the already overtaxed elements of effort and technique. Experiment then became the final aim. Okay. And this is talking about, we'd be looking into, um, we talk about antinomian music. Um, Alice Cooper, to be honest, at least on a level of music, is uh, I'll show basically how the same thing with the atonal music, avant-garde, you know, even the painting, modernism happening at the same time. This was, it came out of nowhere as a fully formed entity, so to speak. We'll talk, I'll talk about the six, the six, these groups of uh, composers in Paris. But just like Alice Cooper, it was sort of forced upon people. And in fact, it was governmentally mandated during the Cold War this, the music I'll be talking about. So you say, why, why would that happen? Um, you know, and it's not about, it's not a popularity contest, but we'll see that, you know, there's, um, there's a disturbing element, right? We say antinomian element that that's occurring. Let's, let's uh, you know, and f uh, you know, we've gone into antinomianism before, but we should probably define what antinomian is, I think. And, uh, it's really, it's a very important topic. In fact, I define it in my article in Theogen's What's in a Name because 
uh, Professor Marlene Dobkin DeRios talks about it in uh, using psychedelics. So, uh, and uh, just really quickly, it means of or relating to the view that Christians are released by grace from the obligation of observing the moral law. In other words, you shouldn't bother living in truth <clears throat> just by grace, just by accepting Jesus. You don't have to actually change any behavior or anything. And we see a lot of the megachurch preachers uh, promoting this idea. All you have to do is accept Christ, but you don't have to actually change any behavior. You're, or, you know, and in this case, it's, you know, antinomian means against the law, really. And so, uh, it's used, <clears throat> you know, l like Anna Hutchinson from the uh, from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the 1600s. She's she and I think it was John Cotton who were originally the big promoters of antinomianism, and they promote her and John Cotton as big cultural heroes and icons. Anne Hutchinson went went on to found uh, the state of Rhode Island, but she was a rogue. She was thrown out, even. By the Jewish Puritans, she was thrown out of, of Salem. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, what they did was they would create pseudo forms of Christianity like Puritanism, but the antinomianism was a whole philosophy that they developed against Christianity while putting on a veneer of Christianity at the same time. But it was really there to undermine the uh you know christianity as far as living in truth or logos so it was really there to uh you know to strip that away and to create moral relativism and to promote the very ideas that we see being promoted out in the society today by the cia and everything we've exposed over you know the last many years Great. Yeah. Thanks for that, Jan. Um, I, I did look up the definition myself. Um, and you can look at it as overthrowing the moral order, but it is this idea of rules, regulations, structures, even as we'll see with tonality, uh, with naturally arising harmonic frequencies and deliberately violating that, going against that on purpose. That is in that in a different way. And, you know, it's the in same some ways, thing in a, in a different application. Yeah. And, and maybe even uh sort of a deeper application. But I just want to read a few quotes here just to get, keep the rock thing going before I dive into the heady world of Stockhausen and uh, Varese. But uh, so this is Alice Cooper. Quote, when the Beatles walked into a room, everybody wanted to be near them. I always said, when Alice Cooper walks into the room, I want everyone to take a step backwards. So we created this villainous character I went to see Barbarella, the Black Queen. She had all the leather and switchblades coming out of her hands. I went, oh, that's what Alice should be like. That should, there should be a real dangerous sleekness to him. Then I saw whatever happened to baby Jane, where there was this old woman trying to look like she's five years old again with smeared makeup and all the wrinkles. And I said, that's Alice too. All right. So there we go. There's Alice, um, which, of course, again, the band was not this is also backtracking in the sense the band itself was all called the Alice Cooper group until he put everyone else out the pasture. Here's another. I'm just reading some quotes here. Um, you know, I got all these sources for the last week. So um, and this is Bobby uh, Liebling, uh, heavy. These are all like heavy metal guys. Um, I was practicing all kinds of black arts and occultism and Satanism. And I was a member of the Satanic Church in the D.C. area. I did a lot of incantations and was in an actual coven. One night I was at a friend's house. We always kept a couple copies of Anton LaVey's Satan Satanic Bible around and books on witchcraft and spells in the occult. It was July 4th, and we were completely sober. We were sitting in the basement and reading from the Satanic Bible. And all of a sudden, I started to blow a little fog out of my mouth. I was into the reading and hadn't noticed that the room had gotten ice cold. All the pipes in the entire basement formed droplets of water and became icicles. The basement windows were covered with frost and the entire room was about 25 degrees. And this was a matter of 10 to 20 minutes. I got scared. Um, and then he said, actually, Bobby said after that, he quit being a Satanist. Okay, but there's another, uh, another, another quote. Uh, just This is a guy from the band. This is Joey 
Haslander from Pentagram and Raven. Uh, Bobby conjured up something that scared him to death, and he ran out of the house and never came back. Of course, you're supposed to close those doors, but they never did. And I think that's part of why he has had so many problems in his life with drug addiction and a lack of financial success. I really believe that because something like that happened to me. I found these tarot cards dating back to the Salem witch trials that were at a house in New York where we lived with Raven. They were coated in human blood. They were horrifying. I took about 10 of them. They almost destroyed my life. A spirit was found in two of these cards, and the person who was bound to them had invoked demons and was probably responsible for the Salem witch hysteria. He made people go nuts by sending cursed objects out to them. It caused an incredible poltergeist outbreak in my house, and I had to move. Da da da. It, it, okay, and it goes. He's talking about Salem. Okay, kind of interesting. So this guy was um, Cliff Burton uh, was killed. He says Cliff Burton from Metallica was killed because of these cursed uh, tarot cards. Um, and then um, I just read one last quote here. Uh, this is just just random crap, but uh, this is Zach Wild. Um, from uh, played with Ozzy Osbourne, Black Label Society, Zach Wilde. When we were recording the album Osmosis in 1995, we did a batch of it in New York. There was an occult bookstore called The Magical Child, and they had everything in there about Wicca, Catholicism, Satanism, the whole yards. I was getting some Aleister Crowley stuff because Jimmy Page owned the castle. That's Jimmy Page's, of course, famous. He bought Aleister Crowley's house, and the other guys were into him. I'm like, what's the skinny on this guy? I'm buying books as if it were a book report. I go to get this poster of Aleister Crowley, and I, and I said, how much for the poster? The guy looked at me deadpan and says, $6.66. I put seven bucks down and said, keep the goddamn change. Ozzy asked me, Zach, who's the guy up on the wall? And he goes, Zach, who the fuck is he? I said, I don't, I'll try to swear, I don't effing know. You've been singing about him for the last 20 years. He's like, well, who the fuck is it? Oz, it's Aleister Crowley. Oz says, oh, that's what that bald-headed cunt looks like. That's a great line. So supposedly, I don't know, maybe it wasn't that funny, but so basically Ozzy had never seen a picture of Aleister Crowley, which he admitted he was pronouncing wrong. So everyone says Crowley. That's from Ozzy Osbourne. So I don't know. That was just, you know, take, take from that what you want or what you don't want to. Obviously, these are heavy metal artists and performers, but um, there's another quote, though, that um, from uh, Crosby, David Crosby, and he says that, you know, what we're what we're doing is we're going to capture the children's minds and take them away forever from their families and their parents. So so it, it's there. You know, you've got you've got this element, some of it, obviously, a little bit of show, um, you know, like, uh, you know, Ozzy and all this stuff. And then, you know, who knows? True or not. But um, if you want to chime in there, Jan, before I go into the. Well, the I was just thinking crap. they rolled out. Uh, uh, Dr. Jerry Brown, um, who did the uh, book, The Psychedelic Gospels, you know, which is a, a, a professorial hit piece against me but uh to help them help for for uh dr jerry brown to and this this guy's you know his his book is just a total hit piece against me and i i should totally just expose the guy i've i've done a show exposing a lot of what he did but uh they brought on uh, david crosby to help him promote the book against me Wow. <laughs> uh, well, that that's uh, that's some star power, Jan. I mean, I'm at least they didn't bring out Alice Cooper, man. <laughs> at least a little more legitimacy, man. Yeah. You know, David Crosby and the guy actually could sing. He wasn't a complete, a blithering buffoon like a like you know like the orca or the sea the you know sea sea lion can sing better than that guy. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to imitate a sea lion, but uh, <laughs> but uh, so. Okay, well, back to the, the meat here. Maybe we'll just BS. But I wanted to get into some of the neuroscience behind how this stuff actually can affect you or certain things um, and a little bit how this works and, and tie this into a larger contextual model of some of the reasons for these types of, quote-unquote, antinomian outbreaks. So 
familiar with the reticular activating system. You familiar with that? Particular what system? Reticular activating system. No, go ahead and explain okay, that. So, Just yeah, for the, the retic- audience anyway. Well, no, it's not, you know, shit. I, I thought you knew what it was. Okay. Yeah. I, I, we probably <laughs> covered it before. I, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding, man. So the reticular activating system is part of our brains or our, our makeup, right, that, that brings together our senses and determines what we see as real, how we actually interact with the world in terms of like what, uh, you know, what is available to us, what, what is not available. Um, and and it, it either, you know, allows certain types of information or shuts them down. Okay. And this is one of the ways that, you know, when you get this modulated or modified, right. And that's one of the things that, um, um, you know, it, that relates to what the, the, you know, some of the stuff about the music, you know, not saying that, you know, it's like the, you know, that the chicken is going to come bite you, but, um, you know, so it's connected, you know, it's with the brain. I won't get into all the details, but it connects with not only our uh, waking and sleeping, but also with our, our endocrine system, our, you know, uh, various types of glandular stuff, um, which is quite, quite important. Okay. Um, so we're looking at cardio- cardiovascular control, pain modulation, sleep and consciousness, habituation. Okay. That's where certain types of things you learn to ignore types of stimuli you also learn to focus on others and then somatic motor control related to moving auditory perception Um, but really in a sense it it really is the one part of our brain so to speak that that affects our reality right we're talking about dopamine norephedrine serotonin histamine uh, acetylene glutamate etc and so this is um a bit of, you know, we talk about some of the effects. I'm going to look at some of the literature and see how this stuff, you could say, could be um, injected and what may or may not be going on here. But anyways, you'll learn about something, or I will. So first I'll talk a bit about, um, this is related to the theory or the, the science sort of embodied cognition, right? And this is how we relate our environment with our senses, how we function with the connection between our sensory inputs, our motor system, and then also our our situatedness, right? How we are in the environment, how we see ourselves in the environment, how we model it or map it in our minds, but then also, of course, how the environment is. For example, if there's a tiger running at you, that's going to affect, you know, more than just if you're tripping and the walls start to melt, right? A little different, but... um, um, and this is called the temporal information. So temporal information this sets our sense of time, how fast time flows, how we see ourselves in time. But it's also relating all these different types of stimulus and linking them and connecting them, right? But it allows you to guide your actions, allows you to function in the local situation, right? So that it's, it's, it's a process of your, your mind itself uses the environment it's called also offloading of cognition. So you can use the external environment for processes, neurological processes, et cetera. But we have our arousal attention system, again, reticular activating system. And then we go all the way into sensory transmissions, the hippocampus, our memories, episodic memories, our limbic system, and our emotions and behavior. So all of these are tied together and they're also tied in with our motor system with our limb movement and things like that. So we'll talk a little bit about rhythm as that goes, right? Um, and then because of that, we get our sense of what I call sit, you know, well, one we call situatedness. Um, and that is where you, you are linked with your social culture environment, right? So you're this base level of uh, mental processes, right? Again, reticular activating system, It relates to arousal, but awareness, but also really, um, it also determines what we see, what we don't see around us, how we interpret it, okay? Um, And then this, you know, the, this entire linkage with our uh, embodied sort of cognition. Um, And I'll just give you an example. Okay, this is a study, Hein and Hein, 1958, difference between sensory and motor uh, kittens. So the kittens were raised in a dark uh, environment and exposed to light only under controlled conditions. Um, The first group of animals was allowed to move around normally, but each of them had to pull around a cart 
in which wrote a member of the second group. Sounds like a fun experiment, right? The two groups thus shared nearly identical visual experiences, but one group experienced the world actively and the other passively. Upon release in a few weeks, the first group of kittens behaved normally, but the second group behaved as if blind, bumping into objects and falling over edges. The sec um, hence, objects in the world were apprehended not simply by visual extraction of features, but rather by the visual guidance of action. Okay, um, let me just break that down a bit, right? So you have these kittens, one group of kittens is riding around in these carts, right? They're not actually walking or they're not walking much, right? They're being moved around. They're getting the stimulation coming into them from outside. They're not actually being engaged with the world, right? So the, uh, and then of course they have limited light conditions. The other group, they, did, they were blind, not because of they had the same exposure to light that the moving group did, but because of that, their visual system was impaired, right? So now we look at, okay, I'll just leave that there unless you want to go further into that. So this is just keep this stuff in mind. I know it, we can kind of keep going um, in, in a lot a lot of different ways. But so what we're looking at though is that not only you know who we see a lot of we say who we are. I mean, so much of this. If you start tweaking some of these systems, and then you can push someone almost like that kitten, the kittens that think they're blind, right? You could push people into this space where they no longer are able to see the world around them, but are in a, in a sense, you know, atrophied and they're caught up in these loops. Um, and so the Pokemon world we exposed last year, essentially, but in day to day life and expanded to a greater level. Yeah, but I, I think that, you know, there is a certain extent, right? Um, well, I don't want to extrapolate too much from that information, but it's uh, l let's just move a little bit into uh, uh, Huxley. I just say, said that people wanted to drink. Oh. I, I just said it. It had nothing to do with what I'm going to say now. <laughs> okay. Well, at least you so, said it first other than me, so it's not my yeah. fault. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we go back, and this is what – this is uh, – Green tea, by the way, unfortunately, or fortunately, that's good for me. Um, okay, so, so now now we'll talk this a little bit about water, not vodka. I, I, how can I, I don't believe you? <laughs> I don't believe. Yeah. Um, so okay, so next thing I, I'm gonna uh, read a little bit here. Um, I've got uh, this is um, Bateson and Mead, right? So we're talking about the, the development of cybernetic systems you know, through the Macy conferences. And of course, you know, you have a huge array of material on Bateson, but this is Bateson in his sort of white coat, you know, talking, interviewed by Stuart Brand, which is quite interesting. I'll try not to read all of that. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so Bateson, uh, that was another story. That's before Richardson and even b way before feedback. Already in Naveen, there's a statement that complementary schismogenesis neutralizes symmetrical and vice versa. If you get into too long a contrast between the bosses and the workers, which is complementary schizmogenesis, you put them all out on the cricket field and make them play cricket, which puts them in a symmetrical situation. And it doesn't matter who wins the game of cricket, you know? Okay. Typical Bateson, totally arcane statement with lots of weird encoded stuff. You well, Go ahead. Oh, somebody was asking if uh, they could get keywords uh, during the show so that uh, they could just do research to follow along uh, more on some of the topics. I thought that was a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe I can uh, we'll, uh, see if I could go to the uh, – should I go to YouTube or something, or should I just text you and you Yeah, well, it? yeah, you can go to YouTube if you want. Just make sure you have it muted when you pull it up. Otherwise, I mean, you know, it'll uh, – did, did you get the link for the show? Uh, no, I just got the, the – um... Uh, I got to. All right. One. I'll, I'll email it to you. Just keep going and I'll send it to you here in a second. Okay, great. All right. So, yeah, so there's different teams. Well, well so we want to look at a little bit into cybernetics, right? And I'll try, I probably won't go through all this material because I like reading what they actually say. It's that, you know, I can interpret it for you, but I think it's also good to grapple again, like Bateson, he throws a lot of stuff in there. But cybernetics is based on this, it, the base idea of cybernetics goes back to this, the governor, right, of the steam engine. So when you have a steam engine and they install this mechanical device, 
Um, it's called the governor. This represented a type of system that was a self-sustaining system. Um, later used, um, you know, for the development of guided missile systems. Um, and then it became part of the Macy conferences and in fact was the core of the Macy conferences, even though the first conference was more about hypnosis um, in, in uh, different words. So schismogenesis is a, uh, a term. So you have these cybernetic systems or loops. So negative feedback in a cybernetic system enables you to correct course to break the loop and positive feedback keeps you inside that loop. So notice positive thinking, positive negative, and a lot of the positive thinking movement and self-esteem, et cetera, came directly out of cybernetics, but they neglect to tell you that in cybernetics, negative feedback means you are able to get out of your the cybernetic loop system, and positive feedback means it's gonna continue and intensify. So schismogenesis is a term that Bateson came up with to describe individual family, societal, culturally wide processes of people being caught in a self-reinforcing feedback loop with different positions, antagonistic, but they're actually, you know, as they battle each other, they, they, they are trapped more and more with, or trapped, they are, the loop itself has this autonomy, it becomes almost like a, like a type of autonomous uh, uh, system that, that it continually increases energy and, and actually there, and it, then all feedback just makes that loop stronger. Um, here's an example. He talks about husband and wife, um, you know, and things like that, but he mentions bosses and workers. Okay. Um, and then just, this is Mead. Um, I remember Robert Merton saying once that there wasn't a person in the country who was thinking hard about problems who didn't have a folder mark somewhere like circular systems. Horney's book, The Neurotic Personality of Our Times, that's Karen Horney, the uh, psychologist, discusses the vicious circle and intervention in the circle and the effective intervention. M Milton's paper on the girl with migraines, headaches. Okay, then it just goes on. Um, so, so this is the idea. This neurotic personality is a type of one of these cybernetic systems, okay? So again, it's, it's cybernetics, um, Macy conferences, started out in the beginning, look up Norbert Wiener, God and Gollum, I won't go into all that, but the transhumanism was embedded in the very beginning to create machines. If the machines can reproduce themselves, then are they not, have they not become like God or are they Gollum or who's the, go okay. But it's, he's, these guys are pretty weird. Um, so uh, just, okay, and this is, uh, just lead a little bit more here. Yeah, and actually the, the Gollum thing is uh, what influences the whole Frankenstein, Frankenstein character by uh, Mary Shelley into uh, transhumanism as well, which, of course, is cybernetics, is directly tied to transhumanism. As well as cyberspace, as well as the entire information uh, computer science stuff. A lot of that came out of that, too. But, okay, um, this is Stuart Brand, Mr. Whole Earth, Mr. Hippie. Mr. Happy Hippie. Uh, Margaret, basically what, launched the psychedelic revolution as well. Yeah, yeah. So, Margaret, what was your perception at the time of the early Macing meetings as to what was going on? The thing that cybernetics made the most difference to me, aside from all the things you know, in the social organization field, was the interaction between mother and child. There had been too much emphasis that there were temperamental differences among children so that you respond differently to a hyperactive baby than you did a quiet baby. But to the extent to which there was a system in which the mother was dependent on what the child had learned as a stimulus for the next position wasn't articulated until we got the cybernetics conferences going. So we're, they're talking about circuits between mother and child, input-output events, so the bigger circuits, and then the engineers who take place in that circuit. So mother and child, a lot of this stuff was based on looking at communication between mother and child, et cetera. And we're talking about, again, the reticular activating system, the embodied cognition, how this can be shaped, modulated, mutated, or else how it could potentially be affected. Um, and I'll try to skip ahead here over this stuff, but oh, this is a great quote. Um, so now we, before we go to the next phase here, I want to stress that, okay, Margaret Mead, there's a video she talks about the family, the new, the family of the future made in like early 70s. And she interviews all these couples, like one couple is, is a, 
a, a man and two women with their kids and they all sleep in the same bed. And the guy, they started out with the two couples living together. And now the one guy has both girls and they're lying in bed and the kids and, it, and Margaret Mead, it's in her video and saying, this is a family of the future where you've got this couple where, you know, the woman left her husband, they all three have sex together and the kids sleep in the same bed. Um, there you go. And that's Margaret Mead's uh, family structure um, or part of it. Um, but this is about what happened to cybernetics. It sort of faded from favor in the U.S. Um, okay, and he's talking about um, you know the the cybernetics book, which came out about the same time as a Kinsey book by Norbert Wiener, and was just as much a bestseller. But anyways, me, uh, he's talking about Norbert Wiener. Yes, he wrote the book Cybernetics and sort of patented the idea to that extent. Then he went to Russia and was very well received. The Russians were crazy about this right away. And this is in early 50s, right? Late, late 40s. Uh, and it fit right into their lives. But one of the big difficulties in Russian psychology is that they have this great difficulty learning anything that's irreversible. <laughs> so cybernetics spread all over the Soviet Union very rapidly. Uh, and in Czechoslovakia, where they actually use cybernetic systems to model the culture. Um, so that's just that's just a little... You know, I'm throwing stuff out there. You know, like I said, I, I can't uh, go into, um, you know, too much detail here because then we'll be here for like seven, seven years. But anyway, so Mead set up the Society for General Systems. They're looking directly into social organization. Okay, social organization. And then we have this model of these various systems. And this goes to neurophysiology. It, there's, uh, you know, bio, uh, biocomputing, right? That's all part of the cybernetic system. To fuse man as a machine to model the human behavior as a machine and also be able to replicate and extend processes from both the social individual level to groups, to societies, even globally. So that was the uh, very important part about uh, cybernetics, and then again, note the fact that it became very popular in Russia. And this is this became uh, in the U.S. It sort of fell on hard times, and they changed the name, as I mentioned, the Society of General Systems Research. Um, and like I said, it was very popular when it first came out. It was you know that's where you have the book Psycho Cybernetics. The self help movement came directly out of cybernetics. The word cyber, cyber culture, cyberspace. All the stuff came directly out of cybernetics, in fact, you know. But, you know, uh, it, it, again, it fell out of favor. And then the, uh, the, then the CIA began to fund uh, the, the cybernetics research in the U.S. at the same time, well, before about, you know, 15 Was it years. ever really separated from them? Well, it, you know, there is a sense where it did fall out of favor um, in terms of ac application and, and people started to poke holes in it and counteract it. So it had this big fad. Um, it kind of, it, then it started to kind of, it, at the same time, it started to fall out of favor. It, it was introduced in the Soviet Union and became very, very potent and powerful there. But then the CIA began to sort of vamp up research, most likely because to a certain degree of the Soviet interest. But also, again, we have, you know, that's, uh, that's a whole nother story, but Rand, you know, Rand Corporation, all this other stuff. But I think partially some, you know, it, it could have been something where some of the, um, cybernetics people either piss people off or they're you know who knows um or it could be a cover story uh you know just like neuro-linguistic programming that was just everywhere in the you know when it came out 78 um you know whatever late 70s then you have like anthony robbins uh his self-help empire came out of neuro-linguistic programming um and and many other people and then it's sort of completely faded from the public can and was just listed as this discredited system that no longer works. And so we just poke holes in it. And there's a few people out there that still do it, but it was no, it did nowhere like the media exposure. But at the same time, of course, what happened, it became embedded right into the media systems uh, to a certain extent and all kinds of other areas. So there's, there, there could be a parallel with that, uh, with the cybernetics and NLP in terms of suddenly kind of falling out of favor and actually being integrated in it. And, and so, you know what I mean? So the information is yeah, not as... and they also went from uh, NLP to NVC, but all of those were, you know, in uh, MKUltra programs, Dr. Carl Rogers and uh, Robert Anton Wilson, Richard uh, Bandler, and John Grinder were all behind that. But, you know, this was uh, MKUltra Subproject 97, 
and <clears throat> they eventually they move on with it and uh, kind of morph it into nonviolent communication by uh, Marshall Rosenberg, and uh, you know it's promoted by Tigs Canada, Rianne Eisler, Terence McKenna. They all use it or used it. Uh, Rianne Eisler was Club of Rome and Club of Budapest, and she was involved heavily in uh, cybernetics with Gregory Bates and et cetera. You know, so then we see how they kind of morph all of this and then use it. Uh, well, and we see all of this stuff out there today. You know, the language is about focusing on your, your supposed needs. Well, you know, you're upset. It's not the fact that, you know, you know somebody's lying and selling false information. You're upset, so you must have some need that isn't being met. What is that need? And it's like, well, you know, the need is for you to, you know, to tell the freaking truth, not to make up and spin it on me and and then you know to to create a sort of a kill the messenger type of, of scenario or appeal to ridicule and you you take it away from the focus on the facts to the needs of the person and so in this way it's an ad hominem attack and it constantly shifts the conversation away from facts and information into uh, feel good stuff no, absolutely. Yep. And if it looks like I'm, man, it, it's kind of scary seeing myself. I'm trying to type. I have my computer elevated. So it's about to fall over. And I saw myself on the YouTube a little bit delayed. That was uh, scary. Uh, so yeah, yeah. You know, I, I know I, I see you on there too. It's definitely scary stuff. Hey man, that's, that's not cool. Buddy. <laughs> hey man, we're having conflict here. Uh, so there's a name, the name Utpala Bora. That's actually me. And I'm just posting, um, some some terms here but i I'll, I'll probably do that in a bit when yawn yawn goes off all right well you know huh for some reason it, it just uh youtube just went like totally changed screens on me here i'm wondering what the heck just happened did they just like switch like their system like live during the dang show all i did was hit refresh and it totally changed the mm. stupid screen here it was yeah. acting up weird yeah. anyway go well, ahead well, I'll try not to get too much into the chat. I will uh, bounce back. If I start reading it, I'll, I'll lose my train of thought, which yeah. is uh, which is a very fast train. So anyways, so, okay, just again, you know, we <laughs> looked at several, uh, <laughs> several different aspects. Now let's look a little bit more into the, uh, the uh, science, um, you know, science stuff. And just what I want to say that there's, um, there's reason to believe that the programmability of the brain uh, extends far beyond childhood, right? So this stuff can be changed and rechanged. And so you can, that's the positive side is you can, all these things can be broken. Um, but it's, again, it's just interesting to kind of understand what's going on. So, um, and this is, um, a neuro, uh, let's see, neuroscientist guy. Okay. So this guy named uh, Mornier, who's a, a, a neuroscientist and he, uh, I'll, I'll kind of break this down after I read it. Um, it is hardly necessary to recall what happens to the electrical activity of the brain when a subject suddenly awakens and becomes alert or excited. There's a real spectrum of changes paralleling the transition from deep sleep to alertness or an excitatory state or from deep narcosis to wakefulness. The chief changes are accompanied by electrical activities of increased frequency and lower voltage, the so-called desynchronization of electrical patterns. At the same time, the cortex becomes more reactive to afferent stimuli. All organs, including the cortex, can be considered as a terminal organ, simultaneously show a change in reactivity and functional readiness. The shift may be due to a greater generalization of afferent stimuli or to a greater reactivity of the sensory, cortical, and motor organs of the same stimuli. On the contrary, deep sleep, there is, okay. So anyways, what we're saying is that um, we have this idea that there's this electrical activity. Our brains are run on electrical activity. There's a excitation and there is a slowing down in terms of how that brain uh, responds to stimulus. And one of the ways to... Um, to do that and primarily to do is actually through varying the stimulus using rhythm, using things like entrainment, uh, et cetera. Um, okay, so that so we have, you know, so we have electrical voltage, we have overstimulus, um, and then uh and, and affecting, we'll see even that. So the way it affects your respiration, your blood flow, your heartbeat, etc. And this is also happening with music, right? So we see that music 
in a sense, uh, or music, not necessarily music uh, on its own, but um, uh, basically that, that the effect of this stuff can go from a whole range of levels. We hadn't even gotten into the, 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 co the social coding, but basically to say that we have a variety of processes that can be influenced. And this is this reticular activating system becomes a core network, right? When this is, you know, moved in and you have like, you know, different types of, uh, you know, neural chemicals being released, things like this. This is how these states can become, become they, they go from being a physiological condition to become a psychological condition, thus thereby creating a loop. Right, a cybernetic type of a loop with positive feedback, which means that the loop is just going to keep going, if not increase in intensity. So we, again, remember these reversal terms. All right. So that's, uh, I, I'm going to skip. I have way too much the neuroscience stuff. I'm just going to stop there. Um, I, I can bring stuff up later, but I'm tired now. My brain hurts. I had to think too much. No, just kidding. <laughs> but um, so we look at this and then we just the last thing I'll just mention is self-esteem, right? So this idea, this concept of self-esteem, how it was introduced, how it's very much connected with all of these things, self-concept, self-worth. Um, I think it was named Rosenberg or Rosenblum, the guy that developed this self-esteem test. Um, and so the self-esteem we have these new words being coined, right? Self mastery, self, whatever. So you find some words, right? Uh, that existed before, but we really see a huge uh, generation of these hyphenated terms. The key thing is that the person is broken off and observing themselves. So self-esteem doesn't, okay, technically you could say, oh, it's, I have high self-esteem today. I feel great. You know, like James Brown, he always has high self-esteem. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I'm not talking about high on cocaine. <laughs> no, actually, he, he used to do PCP. That's oh, that's it? some even a PCP addict. I mean, to even become a PCP addict, that's pretty. That's a that's an accomplishment. I'll, I'll give him that. But uh, and he did feel good. Uh, I'm sure <laughs> until, until he died. But uh, but you know, so self esteem is actually related to how you see yourself in social groupings in the eyes of others and how you interpret that back to yourself. So you're not only you're seeing yourself through how you think other people think about you and then you're thinking about that. So that's what self-esteem is. It's already got all these dichotomous splits um, and we've already cut ourself off, right? In a sense, well, self is cut off. The self is observing the self that doesn't have self-esteem and it's, it's like attached to you, you know, but you're actually not even seeing yourself as you evaluate and judge yourself. You're seeing yourself as in the eyes of others, as you imagine what others think about you. And so, and the thing is kind of self-esteem. It's a constant battle. It can go up and go down. You can lose self-esteem, you know, da, da, da. So we see all this politically correct culture also coming out of this. You hurt my feeling stuff. Yeah. Um, and, but also it, it's a ideal formulation. If you take this on, if it's promoted to you, if it's embedded, into your life, you know, like people that hang themselves after watching Alice Cooper do it, or people that, you know, get depressed when their, you know, their likes go down on Facebook and, or people that fall off cliffs taking selfies. <laughs> That's different, but uh, you know, it's the same, you know, it, it's a similar process, but it is still, it is directly coming out of cybernetics. And again, this, this type of model, if this is what you think your psychology works and you even use this term, you've already, put yourself into someone else's system that's being embedded into your own mind that will make it even more difficult to, to retract things and also make you more pliable to these types of influences. And again, I, the stuff I'm saying, it's starting, starting from the bioenergetic level. It's starting from a physiological level beyond all the other, beyond all the demons, you know, from the dead chickens. <laughs> the dashing rogue asks, so they are burning ideas into the mind to strengthen the neural pathways in the brain in a nutshell, question mark. Um, it's OK. We have to see that certain baseline systems. Right. So you basically what you are aware of. Right. There are things you don't notice. There's things that you see. There's a way that you you experience the world. What gets your attention 
how you, what creates arousal, what creates the deactivation of that. That's really, we're talking on a sort of a baseline level of the human organism, right? So we have that, right? And then you have, you know, neural pathways, you have habit patterns, um, but we have to look again, this is the entire mind body and the mind as embodied in a social environment. So, you know, I hope I'm not jumping too far. So certainly creating neural pathways, but we have to look at it as these kind of stacked cubes, this tetragrammaton, this uh, secret box of uh, of principles, right? That are that are there. Um, in which you know, this is not something you know that's it's. You, of course, this is how you are, right? This is called being a human being. Just deal with it, man. You know, unless you're an alien, some kind of a lizard, and you don't have any emotions. Um, but basically, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, but it, it does. It, it, it neural pathways is certainly part of it. But again, you have to look at the stuff is influences, and we're talking about these lips, these loops. And then if I didn't get into the autopoiesis, which is a, the self-sustaining loops with all these different types of things that are going in there, right? And that's, it's quite a complex concept, but this relates to an individual and how all these things can function uh, in a single individual. Hopefully I didn't make it more. You know, I, I wonder if all of these systems, you know, if, if we're able to make all of these systems collapse that the CIA and these intelligence groups are all running, you know, and it just like, where people are shocked into awakeness, even for a, you know, for an hour, what the frick would happen if people suddenly were shocked into a, into awakeness, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Okay, so so now let me. Um, I'm not. I, I deleted my uh, bash, the great professor, the great guru. I won't even say his name. I'll just say JP. So, oh, God. <laughs> but I'm not going to go into that. I got a so, strange, funny feeling in my stomach when you said just the initials, you know. Uh, that, that's uh, dude. Anyways, um, so now let's look at this. Now, I, we're talking about antidoming music, and now we're actually going to the sort of the heart of the show. Oh, we're done. Now, okay. Now I'm just getting started here, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Tease the audience. You're going to get them freaked out and upset, you know. No, no, I, I, I'm just, I'm not teasing. I just. You know what, um, you know, and uh, why don't we ask for, uh, you know, of course, all of this research that we do is is paid for by public donations. So please donate to Hans, Dr. Hans Utter, and that's uh, HansUtter.com. And what's your email address again so people can write you uh, and donate? HansUtter at Hotmail.com. And then, of course, you can uh, donate to contact at LogosMedia.com or go onto the website or hit the Super Chat. Or there is a Patreon button in there. I would really love for someone to buy me a nice dinner tonight. I'm freaking starving. I need to get dinner right after we're uh, done here. And, uh, man, we only brought in like 47 bucks tonight. Pretty pretty bad night. It's actually been a pretty bad uh, last month, too. So any and all support is uh, greatly appreciated, especially during the holidays. And uh, throw Hans some love, too, so we can uh, – keep doing more of this research, you know, I mean, shoot, you know, Hans knows I've been calling him on the phone, digging through the ar ar archives at Princeton, just going, you know, <laughs> reading them up to the minute f discoveries and stuff while we were in the archives digging through stuff. But anyway. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, it's, it, that's important. And uh, I appreciate it. You know, and like I said, I, I'm, it, I'm going through a lot of material in a certain way. I'm truncating certain parts of it because some of it's very complex, but hopefully this, as I go to the second phase, it'll start to become much more clear. Um, and this is where I had, I was going to do a little music break, but I'll, I'll do this little first thing. Then I'll start playing this other, all these music clips that I prepared here. So, uh, but so we look at, now we're looking at music. The importance of music is that it actually just like all the systems I mentioned, music cuts across all these levels, can influence all these levels, can heal, can change, can transform uh, either in positive or negative ways, right? So we have not only the effect on the uh, you know awareness, arousal, we have effect on the brain, neural processing, on the limbic system, on, on the cognitive system on the intelligence, on, and also being a manifestation of a, a type of a, a social order, right? And that's something that, that's been seen by a lot of people, whether or not you subscribe, I think I talked about uh, some time ago, was about the, uh, the Chinese, right? How they, they saw the entire order of their society 
emanating from from music um, and we see this what was that in like episode one or two we did on music mind control and psychobiology oh uh, no i think i brought that up i did show with you like a couple months ago i think okay. yeah so anyways but what we see is that these the the order the the, the principles of these types of rhythms and tonal intervals which we say that um you know we have you know tonal music right is a classical music or the way that these intervals come we see this naturally occurring in ch children's development so the development of language even humming simple melodies we don't you know we don't see um you know kids i mean they, they naturally this stuff sort of is uh, is part of the developmental process and and it's related to also how they're situated in the world, but there's something very fundamental about some of the organizing and ordering principles in music, right? And especially the tonality, these rules and these systems, right, that are in place, that there's certain reasons for that. And these relate to many other types of far more complex systems, not only the human body, but we can look at all types of, um, you know, everything from seasonal motion to, you know, planetary uh, rotation, to uh, biological processes, to cellular activity, et cetera. We can find sort of replication of some of this type of basic order coming from some of this we describe as this music that's evolving from, uh, you know, type of we describe as tonality. Because what I'm going to talk about is atonality, of course. So I just wanted to, to say what tonality is and why that it's, it's, uh, it's important. And um, so, I don't know, should I... I, I did put my sitar over there, so uh, I'll just, I'll play it before I have to play some other music. So, all right, so I'll just, um, if you got any questions, um, you know, that's fine. I'll just grab my sitar. It's just literally right here. Um, uh, and um, so, Hopefully yeah. people throw us some more love. Nobody uh, so far tonight, man. It's been a slow couple of weeks, boy. Oh, well. Okay. Well, here we go. Got so, anyways, fifty-nine people uh, watching right now. That's not too bad. Yeah. All right. So let me grab the star here. All right. Yeah. Well, I just, uh, it's not, I have actually have a concert. I didn't have time to practice because of preparing for the show. And I said, you know what? I'll play a bit of sitar because we have to listen to a lot of this uh, different kind of music. So anyways, this is a sitar. You hear that okay? Oh yeah. Play a little bit of Rod Yemen. go just to... the concert before the concert ladies and gentlemen right here at logos media 
Yeah, that's Hans not. Hans Utter's that's, standing ovation, everybody. Oh, well, now I was going to try to. It's not, you know, the proper way to play sitar. I have to sit on the floor. So I was bouncing it on a drum throne. But anyways, so so let's look into now atonality. Um, and so <laughs> somebody said they could feel their chakras aligning. <laughs> well, hopefully, I mean, you know, the music, uh, that's one of the things is that, you know, you have these systems of music, you know, there, there's something there. I mean, at least, uh, to me and hopefully your chakras are aligned. So I, well, hopefully <laughs> they're certainly not going to be disaligned, but anyway, so we have this movement, right. Starting in the early 20th century of atonal music, right? So this is, it, you know, it's a lot of ways much more shocking, say, than, you know, Alice Cooper or something, because um, we're suddenly going against and going against the ordering of this whole system, right, that's developed. We have the, the tonal system of music in, you know, Western classical music and just tearing it down and starting over again. Um, and so uh, Carl Sch um, uh, Schoenberg, Arnold Schoenberg, was really the kind of progenitor of this. He's a Viennese composer, and he came up with this idea that music, um, to be liberated, so to speak, should be no longer obey any rules, but should instead follow these, uh, it's called serialism, these like patterns of 12 notes that are arranged mathematically, and the music was arranged to follow this type of mathematics, uh, but it really completely overturned the entire basis of music up to that point instantly it wasn't like it just kind of came you know it was sort of it wasn't like there was a progression towards that i mean there were some precursors but this was a radical step um that he made and so i just want to play a little clip here of um schoenberg uh, this is actually uh when he was in his wild wild stage uh before he uh you know where he was no longer sort of following some of these rules it's during the expressionist period you know if you see like nosferatu that that kind of thing but uh so this is um pierre lunette and just listen to this this is he actually went much further than this with the full serial music but this is uh pierre lunette it's only a minute and 35 seconds so here we go Okay. You can turn it up a little bit from there. That's a little low. There you go. Am I going to be able to unprogram my brain from this? <laughs> well, this is a little more advanced. So. So it keeps going, right? Um, so that's, and this is again before he went fully serial. So to understand though, you know, um, he began experimenting this like 1901, you know, 1914. Um, you know, so this is when it was starting this. We have all these changes, a lot of this stuff happening, even like the Rite of Spring, which we'll talk about was in 1913. And when that came out, um, and, and so, you know, this, um, you know, so, so this, you know, when he went through this, this music is radically so it, that's not even the 12 tone stuff, right? That's, that's, there's still something kind of there because this is the expressionist, which is, but well, you can see it's about someone obviously going insane or being insane, right? So it's almost like this replication almost of a type of insanity uh, within the music, um, you know, but, it, it, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, uh, that, you um, that, that this was going on, it, there's also a sense of man usurping the natural order, the natural way that tones and frequencies and relational systems go together. And you're completely taking that, just pulling it away from any types of moorings and creating your own system, right? So it's almost like a, a type of uh, rebellion. Against, you could say, no, I say rebellion against God is probably uh, pushing it, but you know, you could say in a certain way, it is a rebellion against 
logos and, and right. Satan. Well, it's you know? very Discordian, which is Satanism. So that would be against, you know, God or Logos. Yeah, I, I promise no one will be harmed by any of the music examples I play. These are <laughs> these, see, these are from, I, I mean, you have to say this is the conceptual basis, right? These are the high culture people that set the stage. This is all like Alice Cooper. I mean, he, if he sees this, he'll probably he'll probably send me a donation, man. I'm giving him so much street cred. He probably doesn't know who, he probably thinks Schoenberg is a type of German mustard or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, but, but, uh, but anyways, you know, just to, to note that this stuff, again, this music, you know, people, I mean, I, I, I assume people, even though this is almost, it's more than a hundred years old, this piece, it's still pretty disturbing, right? It's still kind of, and you listen to the entire thing, it's like an hour long, right? That's just a little segment of it. Um, but, you know, we, what we have, though, is this stuff just came out of nowhere, almost fully developed. You have Les Six. So Les Six was a, was a group of, uh, you know, composers um, that was, you know, looking at, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to create, uh, you know, more of, um, you know, it's sort of this avant-garde and there's several variations of that. Um, the, and so you have this, these like sort of people just coming out with this, this music that's very disturbing. And then we have, um, you can bring up a picture if you want, is uh, Igor Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. And so again, you know, Schoenberg, it wasn't like, you know, wasn't, you know, people weren't rushing out and buying concert tickets, but uh, Stravinsky um, had this ballet that he made, right? He had this ballet called The Rite of Spring. Um, and he actually described this piece as being basically channeled, right? He said, the piece wrote itself through me, but it has very, very intense rhythms. It has very powerful, you hear that in a lot of, uh, a lot of the stuff actually shown up in horror movies and film scoring, right? So atonal stuff, you hear a lot in horror movies, but this dun, 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 you know, this type of additive rhythm is very much part of Rite of Spring. But Rite of Spring, when the first performance uh, and the basic plot is it's a, it's a pagan, a pre, in pre-Christian Russia where there's a, a ceremony, a pagan ceremony to sacrifice a young girl done in 1913, right? So the girl um, who's going to be sacrificed ends up becoming in, uh, insane with the uh, music of the ceremony and dances herself to death. But that, that's the plot of the ballet or this piece of music. But when this was performed, um, I, was, I read a recent well, an account at the time. And people sitting next to each other, everyone was silent for about two minutes. People then started arguing. People started hitting each other with objects. Then they started at throwing stuff at the, at, the, at the orchestra and yelling at the audience. And people were breaking out into fist fights because of the music. It created this massive pandemonium. There was like a moment of people just being totally entranced. And then suddenly this mass pandemonium broke out, right? And so that's the um, sort of a... Uh, you know, a core part of this is that we have this antinomian stuff and we have this atonality being sort of pushed. And, and then also we have, you know, Schoenberg, um, there's, a, sure there's a lot we could go into his more details of his background. But one thing he says is, I do this music because it pleases me. And that's why. And it's there. Um, but the music, of course, it's, it's, it's very difficult because it's like writing a computer program. But it's by its nature, it's going to be horrendously disorienting, ugly, and just, well, not to say ugly, but very extreme dissonance, right? Um, but, you know, to say that one of the things that killed classical music in America was the promotion and, in fact, the funding of all the composition pe professors in the United States to only be atonal serial composers. So they're making these tone rows. It's like bits of numbers, and they just make this stuff up. And they use, use these uh, configurations to create these sort of, you know, mathematical architectures that are just, you know, blisteringly, uh, you know, dissonant. And, and also, um, there's no rest right in that. It's completely dislocated, rooted. So all the composers, you had to be a 12-tone composer. And this is based on the, the Cold War. Uh, Soviet Union, who was not, uh, was actually focusing on more classical uh, tonal music, but they, they had banned this music. So somebody convinced, it may have actually been um, Mr. Theodore Adorno, who convinced the State Department that the United States should only promote this atonal music and, and, and thereby um, generations and generations of composers were forced to write this music if, if you wrote you know, more traditional or music based off of harmonic tonality. 
you, you could either you had to hide that or you couldn't work in the university and it really stifled it at the same time he killed the audiences for the orchestras and, and kind of, you know, obviously music developed, but it certainly hindered that massively. And again, that was directly funded by the CIA promoted, uh, you know, most likely by Adorno who, who himself was an atonal composer. Um, and not to get too far afield, but, uh, you know, the, the tonal system has been described by many people as a representation of Western society and Western culture, although it's normally described in negative terms as the industrialized, you know, patriarchy and the, this stuff. But the music, that tonal music was seen as the representing the social order and atonal music was seen as a disruptive force against that social order. Um, so uh, I can keep going, but if you want to, you want to. Yeah, go some... ahead. Okay. I'm just reading some of the comments in the chat, seeing uh, if anybody has any interesting questions or comments. Okay. So we'll just move on and look at a few more of these composers here. Uh, another one is uh, Varese. Um, and one thing that I wanted to mention is that when we see this movement of music away from someone developing into an artist and trying to access the highest parts of their experience, and their being, because what they're putting out is going to affect other people. And, but it's also, there's almost sort of an idealized sense. You know, there's a sense of trying to, you know, you're not, you may be an angry person, but when you write music, you're trying to connect with a higher ideal, you know, and, and a universal ideal. You're not just staring in the mirror and, and just like, I hate life, man, life sucks, you know, which is, or, or the anger and all this stuff, you know, this idea of just staring in the mirror, right? You see this, this loss of responsibility for creating and putting music out there. And then the second side is just to say, well, whatever I'm feeling is great. I don't need to go beyond my own self because I, my emotions are the most important. And so then you get this process of people potentially creating music that reflects their own insanity um, or perhaps can produce insanity. Hopefully not. And th this stuff won't, but um, this guy is a very like, interesting. Like composer. what's her name in uh, Ireland? that just became a muslim sinead o'connor good grief she's cool i almost shaved my head because i liked her so much <laughs> you should I, I almost became a celtic i was trying to do like sinead she, o'connor she covers. became a muslim now and well, no, I was... last month she almost killed herself and then this month she's a muslim because she hates white people so much you know she's well, you got know... all the white shame and white guilt that's all being promoted to the npcs by uh, soros and all yeah, no, I was trying to become more diverse. And so I had a couple options. One was, you know, imitating becoming a, a male Sinead O'Connor cover artist or, be, or imitating Tracy Chapman. Oh, God. <laughs> male version of Tracy. Okay. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's um, not even attractive as a female version. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so now let's move into another composer, right? So we have uh, the concept of not only of, so first of all, you have this idea of realism, right? So you're removing this idea of an ideal reflection or trying to go to a higher spiritual plane through the music or trying to connect with, you know, you can have tragedy and sorrow, but you're not trying to just, you know, be, you're trying to get something larger, right? You're trying, you know, there's that responsibility that's gone. But also this idea of this, what's the, described as realism. So you're realistically reflecting the environment um, and things like that. And so what we have is uh, Edgar Varese, who is a huge influence on Frank Zappa. Um, you know, this, he's around the same time, around, you know, 30s, 20s, 30s, getting started. So what, what he did was use um, uh, environmental noise, right? He, he had songs where he used noise of industrialization, um, he would use, you know, sounds. I'm actually going to play a couple pieces of his. Um, so deserts, the, the piece deserts is um, use industrial noises. And then we have a poem electronique, which had was performed with 400 speakers. So he had set up, this is, I think, what, 1940, something like that. It was performed um, 400 separate speakers, electron, one of the first people to use electronic music. Um, so music critic describes, this is a, uh, contemporary uh, Francis Ruth uh, describes um, uh, Satie's piece, Deserts. Uh, it does not seek to assert the human will so much as to submit it to the timeless void that is nature. We move through a wasteland of sound. So that's the timeless void. That is that is the Ensahoff, right? The uh, That's a little cabalism there. So let's check out Poem Electronique, um, which again, which is 
you know, uh, early kind of electronic ish piece with uh, 400 speakers originally performed. anyone even heard of electronic music you know okay. like a Let's grateful see. dead space session or something yeah it won't here's the very end here okay well that's okay and this is a singer there's a female singer who's almost like this demonic entity whatever okay so that's that's Varez, right so edgar Varez, um and very important you know these are very prominent composers this is what is going on in the world of classical music in, you know, 1910, 1920, 1930, right? So this, you know, complete revolt. Did you change your uh, volume level? Oh, I, I did. Yeah. Cause I didn't, I was, there uh, you go. Didn't want vape sounds to come through. Um, so, <laughs> Jeez. Hey man, you know, so uh, let me, um, let me play one more little piece um, of, uh, of, of Varez. This is just a, it's only a 30 second clip. This is from the piece deserts that uses industrial noise. There we go. That wasn't that much there. That's just a, um, a clip. Let me stop that. But anyway, so he had like, you know, industrial sounds. He had like, you know, actual factory horns and steam engine equipment. So so we have this idea. Um, uh, and so the Verez says, quote, speed and synthesis are the characteristics of our epoch. We need 20th century instruments to help us realize those in music. So instruments made of, you know, car parts and stuff like that. Okay. So let's move on. So what we see that, you know, these are, you know, pretty radical um, musicians. Um, and then we have John Cage, of course, a very famous uh, composer. He was, um, and a lot of these people were also kind of linked with the beats, uh, by the way. But uh, so John Cage, a uh, very important composer, and one of the most extremely radical composers. Um, and he started using like indeterminacy, ind which is chance aleatoric music where things are randomized, all kinds of things like that. Uh, he's famous for this piece called four minutes and 33 seconds, which I just realized, you know, the, uh, if you have four minutes, it's 240 seconds. You got a six, six or a six, three, three something, but that's a piece of total silence where the artist sits down, piano player sits down, and opens the piano, just sits there for exactly four minutes and 33 seconds. And the audience is supposed to reflect upon their, their own, their own nature. Right. But he was, uh, you know, sort of a Zen Buddhist. Um, and he was very, very influential, um, you know, for his entire lifetime. Um, but let me just read a bit of John Cage. This is a speech he gave at the Juilliard School of Music um, in 1952. And he says, I have nothing to say, and I am saying it. And that is poetry as I need it. Contemporary music is changing, but since everything's changing, we could simply decide to have a glass of water. To have something to be a masterpiece, you have to have enough time to talk 
when you have nothing to say. So that was his whole lecture at Juilliard. In between, he was like banging random noises on the piano. Um, and of course, and, he was new school of social research, which we discussed last week. Yeah. And, and so John Cage really championed this idea that you cannot judge. You can't have a value judgment about it. It's beyond your value judgments. Music is no longer art, culture, anything is no longer in a domain. If you if you inflict a value judgment on something and say, I like it or I don't like it, I, I figure that quote, he's like, then you're trapped. You only are a value judgment and you can't understand my music with your framework of value judgments. Okay. Wow. Um, <laughs> Always selling the, uh, you know, it goes along with the same theme of moral relativism, you know? Yeah. And I'll just read um, an example of um, just a John Cage performance described by someone who saw it. Um, okay. Some of these compositions are a type of glorified play. For example, cartridge music. Phonograph needles are attached to an overhead boom and the edge of a, and center of a table, chosen for the resonance of its vibrations when shoved back and forth across the floor. Cage and a companion, each following a different graphic pattern of events by chance, insert slinkies, pipe cleaners, miniature flags, and even tiny birth, birthday candles uh, into the needle slots of the cartridge and agitate them thereby producing noises in the loudspeakers, which accompany the performance of low vibration sounds culled from the records of his music. One, action, one watches the actions of the two performers uh, as on days one watch the actions of the clowns circulating around the three rings of the circus, and then they get more and more crazy and they can end up smashing and breaking, um, breaking their equipment. Um, and, and so we have... Um, uh, you know, okay, anyway, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave John Cage there, but a very, very extremely influential figure, not, not some, you know, random person. He was extremely powerful, extremely potent, um, and extremely influential on aesthetics, art, et cetera, um, and also on our culture where you can't evaluate or judge anything, right, because you'll hurt, hurt their feelings. So I'll just move on to another composer, Lamont Young, who's connected with the Velvet Underground, connected with Andy Warhol's factory scene. Um, and a whole bunch of other people in the New York City kind of warehouse. Um, uh, they, I think uh, Kale from Velvet Underground actually worked with Lamont Young or was a student. Um, and so Lamont Young um, was, you know, really, um, you know, moving for this very intense, even a higher level of what he's doing. But I want to play an example here of a piece, right? And to understand this piece, this is called The Tortoise his dreams and journeys, the tortoise, his dreams and journeys. It's the name of the piece. Okay. This piece, when it was actually performed, uh, there were two segments that went for two hours each. What you hear was, you know, it, you know, hundred plus decibels, louder than a rock concert. Actually, a lot of people went there. Uh, Stockhausen was pretty hip. You know, a lot of people, when this came out in the sixties, you know, people were taking LSD with the title of the work like that. You think, Hey man, it's going to be a nice, relaxing trip i'll go ahead and you know do that so he listened to this piece and imagine this blasting at loudspeakers for two hours with a short break and then it starts up again for another two hours it's a four hour long piece here we go <laughs> Turn it down. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's the piece that goes on for two hours at massively blasting levels. And it's just that drone. You can hear a little bit of the Velvet Underground sound in that, right? You know, that That is almost like, as we look into it, like sort of like a, we look at the Soviet type of mind control experiments and an actual permanent reconditioning or repatterning with sound influence for people that don't even know they're being mind controlled and have just taken a schizophrenogen, I mean, a, a psychedelic drug. Um, so that's another example of, again, this avant-garde cultural movement, which again, precurses and undergirds a lot of the stuff that was happening 
in 60s rock, we do see a, a, a big interplay when, you know, the rock, you know, with the Beatles, Sgt. Peppers, the rock artist becomes elevated almost to like a classical level uh, status. Um, and I'll just finish up this real quick here. Last, last example. I won't play all of them. This is, um, let's see, where did that go? So this is, um, this is Stockhausen, who's actually kind of an interesting composer. But this, this uh, composition is called Sirius, and it was supposedly meant to draw down the cosmic energy from the planet Sirius and invoke the beings from them and bring draw their energy down to the Earth plane. But just listen to a little bit of the composition Sirius from another avant-garde composer, Karl Heinz Stockhausen. <laughs> stop <clears throat> now it's still going there's silence in there Anyways, so there's microphones getting electronic sound. Anyway, so this is a pretty weird piece. You have to listen to the whole thing. I'm not going to play it. But um, so this is high art, right? This is the pinnacle of Western civilization now. You know, we've gone from, you know, the, you know, the uh, development of a tradition, sort of like painting, right? You look at the amazing paintings in the 13th, 15th, 16th century. Then you got Jackson Pollock throwing paint on a canvas. Exact same thing. Um, in a certain way, this has, even though rock is much more pernicious, this undergirded a lot of the stuff and also helped justify. But in a sense, there was a similar agenda, not at, well, agenda is maybe a little bit too far, but we'll look at actually, um, so let me just finish up here with this section um, real quick. And so we have, um, um, so we move into this idea, which happened a, a little bit around the same time. Well, now we've, we're kind of in the mid sixties here. The idea of actually composing music to directly manipulate the brain to have it listened to through electrodes or even implants and the, of trying to design a music uh, like that. I'm just going to read a quote. Um, this is uh, LaRousse talking about this. The new music made possible by the new instruments and procedures will, be, will not be less or more valid. It will be different. It has been said in a few years' time, our understanding of the reactions of the central nervous system will have advanced so far that it will be possible to produce functional music predetermined according to parameters defined by the laws of sociology and human behavior. Knowledge of sensory systems will permit the diffusion of this music by direct application of electrical stimuli. The musical element will be established, um, okay, and the elements, of instruments of music will have become a clinical electrode applied to the forearm. So um, we have this idea now of actually connecting music as directly behavioristic, you know, kind of skinnerian, but actually directly working on the central nervous system, bypassing anything else. So in a sense, you're going to call it music. It's actually a type of electronic, you know, neural stimulation that, you know what I mean, that will produce these types of changes uh, or states. And that's one thing that uh, Jerry talks about when he talks about virtual reality is this kind of music, but it's actually just created from these you notes. Know, it's directly working on the electromagnetic, you know, neural circuitry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and so, you know, as, as we look and I, I, there's a bunch of these different composers um, that did this, um, this and it's still going right. That are doing this thing of even looking at almost like genetically modifying human voices, merging voices together, um, you have this guy, you know, David Lloyd, who's an inventor connected with this movement of a, this actually sounds kind of fun. It's a vibratory belt. It's, no, it's like a, it's a pad you wear in your pants when you listen to music and it actually vibrates with the music and vibrates, <laughs> I guess would vibrate your special parts, you know, while you're listening to the Rolling Stones. Well, I'm sure. Stuff. Well, and that's why, you know, you go to, not that I've been to one in 15 years, you go to a trance show and everybody's like sitting on and rubbing all over the big bass speakers you know they're getting off on them especially when they're on like mdma or some drug 
Yeah, exactly. And then we have this guy named Forehands, another one of these composers who says his music, if you don't call that, will can reproduce like an LSD experience, can even create an orgasm. Yeah. So we're calling it music. It's it's something, it's it's a different thing. But this has been researched. This is again coming from these composers and all this stuff. And so this is very much any electronic music, of course. We have like Verez, uh, you know, Stockhausen, uh, Cage. These are the early pioneers. I mean, you know, even, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the some of this technology was invented for these guys to use. So this is way before even the Moog synthesizer or whatever um, came along. Um, so we look at this idea that music can actually reshape reality, right? So it's not only... Um, which I'll talk about some of the physical effects here in a second, but music actually can start to reshape reality by, by removing these orders, right? By taking away these orders that are implicit in the customs and the structures, even in the behavioral practices, right? We have types of inhibitions that, you know, these are not necessarily life threatening, but I mean, if, you know, if you want to, pull your pants down and run down the street, you're going to have inhibitions about doing that, right? So there's inhibitions that are also culturally generated, right? Um, you know, there's inhibitions like you can't, well, some people do, right? You can't just, if you're attracted to a woman, you don't just walk up and grab her or something like that. And people do that, but they don't have these inhibitions, which there's a behavioral impulse. Someone may have the exact same thought, but they have these inhibitions. So what we have is a modulation of senses of excitation, but also socially conditioned uh, inhibitions or say socially conditioned structures. Are they inhibitions are, or are they guidelines of behaviors so that we can have a properly functioning society? Well, well, uh, y yes, but I mean, what I'm saying is inhibitions as these are sort of almost hardwired, right? Like you have, you know, you, inhibitions, what I mean, I'm actually talking in the sense of the like central nervous system, where if you try to take some of these actions, you're not like, for example, you know, cliff diving, diving off a cliff, you know, you're not, you know, you just be like, man, I can't do that. You're not just going to go run and jump off the cliff. I mean, you might, but same thing. So these behaviors, yes, there is that aspect, obviously, that these are established rules and guidelines and moralities, but they also become sort of implicit in the conditioning, right? Being polite is a type of inhibition of behavior where you don't raise your voice. You don't punch somebody when, you know, they cut in front of you in line. You may say, oh, you know, that wasn't cool. But, you know, so these are, um, th there's modes of behavior, but then on a deeper level, these are sort of ingrained into the how, going back to what I talked about in the beginning, right? How we function in the world, how we perceive the world, how our, you know, how, you know, basically how the senses are interpreted, you know, and so this is one of the parts uh, actually of music, you know, it was to also create type an organized, orderly society, right? And that was the big critique of a lot of these new composers, uh, as I already mentioned, that this, uh, this, this, you know, fudgy or what do you call fody, whatever you call it, uh, fuddy duddy classical music is is part of the capitalistic control system, and we need social revolution, like we have now, which is really done us a lot of a lot of good right <laughs> so does that make sense so, so the inhibition there's an inhibitory reflex it's like a reflex and it yes it is conditioned culturally because technically nothing's stopping you from just you know you know if you see food you just don't you know steal it right there, there there's an intellectual sense but also you know i'm not telling people to try this out but if you, know, you probably had people dare you to do something and you just couldn't do it you know what i mean you were just you know it felt like you felt blocked from doing it and probably it was a stupid thing to do but when you lose these inhibitions, some of them, then you, you know, you can lose the moral inhibition, but the actual impulse is different, right? Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and it, so we look at this, we see music, right? Especially this loud music, rock music, but all kinds of music uh, influences, uh, powerful influence on muscular activity, uh, increases or decreases overall muscular activity in the body it affects the entire body the entire must you know your muscular system we're talking about you know micro movements and sometimes much more vigorous movements we see the music actually can start to modulate it can start to change um just on a, a level of you know our again our all parts of our body uh increasing or decreasing activity um in fact removing energy from muscles and things like that so that's uh, one thing that happens um, and we look at the effect of sound, right? So this is, this may be a, a w old wives tale or a, an old rock fans tale, but supposedly, you know, 
girls or kids would, uh, I said girls, sorry, that was sexist. It just seems like something a girl would do, but I'm just totally kidding. Uh, where they put, they put eggs on a stage during a rock concert, their egg would actually have been cooked because of the, the sound output. It was so, from the show, it would actually cook eggs. The egg would be cooked from the vibrational output that's coming out of those speakers. So it's a very powerful, um, not even the music itself, but the volume and all these other things. So these things can affect the heart rate. They can, they can change your digestion. Um, in fact, it can cause high blood pressure. Rock can actually, it, it, they've done studies showing that rock music actually can cause some of it, right? I'm not painting with a broad brush, can cause, uh, you know, indigestion. Um, but it also affects your heartbeat, right? So we're going down. We have this cultural level. We have this biological level, this neurological level. But your heartbeat, right? So I'm talking loud there. Your heartbeat can be influenced and you actually can start changing the patterns of your heartbeat and some of those patterns can become entrained, right? They can become almost addictive. And, and that's how people, obviously people get addicted to things that are bad for you. I mean, that's part of being addicted. Um, even people get addicted to like, you know, uh, having, uh, you know, fights all the time, right? You have people that are like that. Um, and then so also the certain types of music, for example, Alice Cooper can create a, a uh, epiphedrine, epiphedrine, sorry, I, I'm pronouncing it wrong, but an epinephrine, um, which is shot into the blood, constricting during stress or anxiety. So, for example, seeing an Alice Cooper show, it's creating this response, right? It's affecting your heartbeat in your skin. Um, you can have, um, you can have, uh, you know, stomach spasms, and your heart muscles can actually, you can actually get heart flutters from prolonged exposure. So you have not only the effect of the sound, you have the effect of the other type of stimulus. Um, and some of the music we listen to, I don't know if people think that sounds like it's, it's a healthy thing uh, to listen to, but it's, you know, that's part of what this is. You suddenly remove a value judgment, right? And then you're pushing for this effect. Um, and again, not to beat the dead horse of Mr. Alice Cooper, but you see that, again, he was pushed down people's throats. No one wanted to hear it. This atonal music, this experimental music was, it came from out of nowhere and was, and then it became the dominant, uh, you know, force in the contemporary music world, thereby devastating the audience for classical music, right? As well as, you know, how many people could have been really creative musicians that either just gave up or started writing serial music, you know, with all this dissonant stuff because they couldn't get the grants because no one was paying for the CDs or concerts or not as much anymore. So there you go. But I'm going to say something, you know. Oh uh, well, yeah. Now they, now they just put it out there for free. I guess that's why the music is even crappier than it used to be now. You know, I mean, it's like clearly you hear these these so-called artists that don't even have any talent that they're just run through a synthesizer and a, and a board, and that's what they're putting out. They don't have, you know, it lacks any quality. And each generation, they've stepped the quality of the music down you know several degrees but you know now i don't know how, how much how much lower can it go i mean uh how much more fornicating or, or how much more defecating on stage and whatnot are we going to see and 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 all that yeah well jan i mean one thing to note is that i, I want to say that you know this is what I'm talking about now is sort of the cutting edge right this is the most advanced minds and people involved in music um or a lot of them right way way above you know your you know, you're, uh, you know, you're rap star, your rocker, but this idea of actually having specific frequencies and tones that will change the brain itself, just from that level, right? That going in, I think some of, I think we could find some evidence of that in some of the newer rap music and stuff like that. Right. Um, and so I think it's moving, but anyways, I'll just finish up here before I yeah, go maybe, off. Maybe we and, should uh, do a show just on how to specifically identify this new stuff that they're rolling out. Yeah. 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 And that's, you know, I, I haven't looked into it that much, but you know, again, I want to show that this, this process, if you look at what happened in the early 19th century or 20th century, and then you look at the sixties revolution, we see a continuum and a thread, right. That's tying this together with certain similar types of things, but we move now um, back to rock music um, this is uh, you know, a famous experiment. I, ha I had the name of the person who did it, and it's not in front of me. 
um, I think it was 1985, but they had as many of these experiments. And I just mentioned this one, they had petunias, right? They had two different sets of petunias. One of them was exposed all day to the classical music station. The other one was exposed to the rock station. Within just several days, the petunias next to the classical music station had moved closer to the speaker. Uh, and then the ones near the rock music were moving further away from, from the speaker. Um, and then the ones that were next to classical music started growing much more rapidly, very healthy. After a month, the, the petunias exposed to rock music died. So they, could, they just withered away and died. Everything else was the same. Volume level the same, watering, whatever, exactly the same. Um, so, and that's just one example. But uh, Was it Mark Passio's Discordian death metal? I don't know, man. I, I, <laughs> no, this is just a regular, I think just a regular, uh, they used the radio station in order to have sort of a broad brush. Um, but, um, and so briefly, so like Mick Jagger said in, in 1960s, I think 66, 67 in an interview, they said, like, what, what do you aim for? Are you trying to become rich and famous? And Mick Jagger said, we are moving after the minds. So are most of the new groups. We're moving after the minds. That's our we're not doing this, you know, not just to make money, not just because we love it, but we're moving for minds and to control and manipulate and shape the minds, right? Um, another example is John Phillips from the Mamas and the Papas. He bragged that he could actually create a riot through music. And he said, well, most groups know how to do it. And he proved himself. Um, so Saturday Evening Post wrote a story about this, uh, 325, 67, and he actually, they were able to incite a riot just by the music they were playing. They knew how to do it. Okay. Um, and then, so now we just shift here. I know I'm kind of summarizing. I just try to get through all this. Um, so we see though that in the United States where suddenly anything goes, right? It's an anything goes culture. So we have all this experimental classical music. We have all this uh, crazy pop music, rock and roll, et cetera, et cetera. Cause we're free. We're a free democracy. The Soviets at the same time, where they maintain their study of cybernetics, also engaged in extremely detailed research, um, probably similar to MK Ultra, but on this conditioning, uh, operant conditioning. Uh, we have Pavlov, we have uh, Luria, uh, you know, and, and ma many other scientists. And so the Soviets were fully aware of the effect of music, and they did a lot of studies, and they and they used music very specifically to to, you know, for certain types of effects in the society. Hence, things like the Beatles were banned. For example, the Beatles were banned in Israel. I don't know if you knew that. They were not allowed to perform in Israel. Um, That's hilarious. The MI6 uh, agents weren't allowed to play in Israel, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and people are having a really hard time. They really need to go back, and, you know, somebody keeps asking. So you mean, like, George and the Beatles, they were agents in the in the chat, but... You know, we've done like 43 shows now. I recommend uh, people go back and watch at least my series with Hans, uh, Music, Mind Control, and Psychobiology, so that you can begin to get your mind around how all of the big pop stars are manufactured and sold to us, especially the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead and all of this stuff. These are the government agents. The the You know, the con trick is that these people, you know, go around in black suits and and defend us from, you know, uh, I don't know, super spies or whatever from Russia, when in fact, you know, most of them are professors, musicians, TV stars, movie stars, you know, professional liars. That's what an actor is, a professional liar. You know, so a lot of actors, but musicians, when you think about it, they travel around with <laughs> drugs and roadies and equipment, lots of places to stash drugs. You go on lots of tours. You're promoting the social engineering on the road. You get paid for it. And, uh, you know, you make you bring in huge amounts of money that the company, the CIA uses to fund other mind control projects, et cetera. So when you get your mind around how this social engineering works, yes, of course, you know, all these people are are manufactured idols, rock idols. Get it? Rock idols. They're graven images, rock idols. And you you go and you. <clears throat> If you went to Woodstock, you were fornicating in the mud to your rock idols. It's all part of the joke of the Dionysian mysteries and the Babylonian, uh, ancient Jewish Babylonian, uh, you know, rites. So this is what it all ties back to when we get in and we and we look at it. But 
we have to be willing to question our heroes and our emotional ties to you know our 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 the heroes that we were spoon fed in junior high and high school i mean eventually you got to grow up and just let it go you know yeah yeah and, and um you know like i said that's that's something that um you know i could it's kind of low-hanging fruit you know we talk about satanic you know initiation and all this stuff i mean you know it, I, i'm trying to get you know again i'm trying to show like a different side uh to it um like i said it's a lot of material but just just to move on forward so we do have this connection right of social revolution we have a connection of actually uh communism with um with you know some of the, a lot of these groups right they were very active uh in this um some more than others but you know so this certainly was a vector um and there was some promotion uh you know we also have you know lots and lots of massive infiltration um so, you know starting from even the 30s you know fdr administration harry dexter white etc cetera, etc cetera. um you know massive amounts of infiltration and in fact promotion um and there's i have lots of fbi documents you know not the fbi is always right but there's a lot of really interesting stuff about this era and what was going on uh, but just one study of Pavlov where he uh, conditioned uh, the dog, you know, using a metronome. They were conditioned to 120 beats per minute, the ticking of the metronome it, for getting food. And they would automatically salivate uh, at that time. And then they conditioned a dog 60 beats per minute, right? So the 60 beats per minute, they don't get food. So they have this uh, inhibitory or excitatory response, right? Something is, you know, you're, you're not going to eat. There's no food. So you don't salivate. You, you have food, you want the food. So you're, you're attract, you know, you're going to salivate because that's a, a, you know, that's a response like a, you know, a, a physiological brain level response. And what they, then he started juxtaposing them, juxtaposing the stimuli and sometimes playing both, both of them at the same time. Um, and, and so basically the dogs um, with, they did like at certain stages, like when they're playing both, of the beats and the dog, the dogs would actually die. It would actually kill the dogs or dogs would just stop eating completely. And they could also induce schizophrenia. So, and this is using again, this rhythm, this metronome, this beat, um, but it's related to a basic biological process. You go to a far more complex animal, like a human being, you can look at say about sex, about breaking taboos. That's why also we have this riding, people going crazy. Um, and I just mentioned the Beatles, right? all the female fans are screaming and going nuts. I mean, they, they were completely. This, especially know, the ones, you know, that they put in right in front of the camera for the photo op and didn't span back to show that they were all clumped together and screaming, you know, to incite other girls to scream, too. Yeah. Yeah. And and so basically. Um, so what actually happens is that you have these types of artificial neuroses, then, uh, which are these patterns that are also linked to types of stimuli that people are totally unconscious that they have any effect on them whatsoever, right? And so you actually have this type of a hypnotic trance state being induced, but then also connected with physiological functioning. And you have something, and I mentioned that that uh, condition, uh, it's, uh, what is it, museo, uh, whatever, is epilepsy or something, where there's you know, examples of people just hear like a pop song or something, and that one song will actually make them go into epileptic seizures, that one specific song. Um, but, you know, with this hypnotic state and this induction, not only of trances, but again, embedding things in the almost the physiological base level, as well as behavior patterns, as well as creating these conflicts. And then you have the autopoietic system. Last thing I'll say here, probably hopefully people weren't too bored, but I, th I thought it's interesting. So uh, this is just someone, uh, Evan von Glasserfield, in an attempt to interpret uh, Matorna. In an autopoietic, autopoietic organism, every perturbation, every experience, every internal event changes the structure of the network that constitutes the organism. So the autopoietic system is the advance of cybernetic theory where you have these interlocking systems, all these different things that are working together. Um, and I won't get into like temporal, uh, you know, entrainment, you know, I, I, isosynchronous activity, et cetera. That's, that's just, I think that's, there we go. That was, uh, if, you know, people may want to go back and check out the show again. Hopefully I didn't uh, talk too fast this time, but I thought it was watch it two or three times. It'll settle in, you know? Yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, well, we, all, we all 43 just... episodes you and I have done, right? Yep. All right. Well, you're, that's you're, yeah. you're hitting that vape hard tonight, dude. Uh, man, it's yeah, no, I'm not, it's not a, it's not much in there, man. It's just, just blowing smoke. <laughs> It's part of my autopoietic system, so this is like yeah, you're getting your your, <laughs> auto, your feedback loop there. Your you get your little dang, you you know your little you step like a little rat stepping on the pedal and getting a little pellet. <laughs> no way, not me. <laughs> it would never happen to me. No, no, no. my little no, pellet. Grief. So uh, yeah, it's, you know, uh, there's I don't know. We got a couple of minutes here before we wrap here. Hit it up at yeah, two hours. Yeah, questions or anything? Yeah, yeah. We can people are asking stuff. Any good questions? You know, most people, if they're asking if somebody is an agent, they probably already know the answer. You know, if they don't provide you the citations that you can fact check and whatnot, you know, we try to provide everything that you know that we research, and you can go through the database and look. You can use the Trivium. Are we making stuff up? Are we supplying the citations and whatnot so that you can follow along? Um, does it make sense? Are there contradictions? And people really need to grasp that a contradiction is always a lie or an error, and there are no contradictions in nature. God cannot lie. So whenever you see a contradiction, you know that's where to dig deeper. It doesn't mean throw your arms up in the air and scream, opinions are like you know what. It means you need more information. And, you know, when you do that and when you dig down deeper, when there are no more, no more contradictions, you know you've arrived at the truth. And that's what uh, people don't uh, want you to understand. And they're, you know, trying to take us away from all of it. Somebody's asking about Kravitz. Ro rock and roll is dead. Now in movies, dramas, and members of the NWA made men. I don't know. You know, I think they're all the all the big stars. They've got to be on the take. Some of them are probably just assets. Some of them might be dupes, but all the big ones, they're on the take. They wouldn't even be big if they weren't dirty, I don't think, you know, because they're selling the whole agenda. You've got to, you, you know, it's like tenured professors, you know, you, when you once you figure out how the peer review system is corrupted and all of that stuff, you know, it's like, okay, so which tenure professors aren't selling an agenda? And once you understand how, how to identify cells and these little circle jerks that they use that were created by Thomas Huxley, you can get in and begin to figure out how to unravel these cells. Are they always citing each other? Do they go down to the primaries? And if they cite each other and, and, and you check the primaries and they're misciting the primaries or taking them out of context and, and whatnot, then you know that they're dirty and they're on the take. And, you know, it's from my experience, it's probably all tenured professors. Um, maybe there's some that aren't at, like, private schools and whatnot. But I suspect, you know, if, if you're a tenured professor, you're probably on the take. You know, that's how you got there. That's how you 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 re and that's how you enforce the peer review system and keep dissenting views out that will question and expose how the system works, you know, they don't want a bunch of people going out there who, you know, with a, with a firm grasp of, of, you know, like the spies and academic clothing article on their minds, because then the whole thing starts to fall apart. And then you begin to understand that most of academia is a sham, you know, they're repeating the, the Royal Society garbage and all of this, you know, manufactured social engineering, they're not interested in in fact, they're not interested in teaching you how to think, but rather what to think. And that's that's the key difference. And that's what we try to do here is teach people how to think and then go out there and figure out who's dirty and, and how this thing works on your own. It's not just up to Hans and I or or Caleb and I or Robert and I to expose all of this stuff. You know, we've got to... Uh, you know, work together and use the trivium and go through and, you know, build our self-esteem up so that we can have faith in our own five senses to bring us the answer and know that we've found the truth and then share it once we've found it. And that's, that's all that we're doing here. And uh, unfortunately, we keep running into the same people when we dig into this stuff, the Huxleys, Adorno, the, the Fabians, the Frankfurt School, SRI, CIA, Esalen Institute, Tavistock, 
you know, over and over ad infinitum, it's always these same groups of people. It's just, you know, a matter of their depth involved of their involvement in the uh, conspiracy, you know? Yeah. Well, there's also the, the function of just having that same process of you can't actually think certain thoughts, right? Do you like, even if you're, you, you get, go through a conditioning process. And so even in academia, you may know some, uh, you know, your local neighborhood, you know, super happy liberal, whatever, that just lives in this bubble. And these thoughts, they, they, or you price it as a cognitive distance. People, you know, they flip out because they have this, this has been set up and it's now like a physiological response, right? It's now, now, of course, this all can be changed, but all this, uh, you know, this processes also affect groups of people, right? You have this mass hysteria. Um, you have people's emotional state, um, even their biorhythms. You know, people are very agitated because um, you get that energy rush, right? You get that that high high energy, power, you know, music, da da da. You know, and you're at, it's like it's like taking some drug, right? It's like taking a drug. It gives you a, a response, but it's also harmful for you. It's like drinking Diet Coke. Uh, and and so you say you and Cameron, he said that if you have music made by insane people, it will spread insanity in the world. Um, and this is when you have this idea of, you know, these psychological effects, this idea of psychological contagion, um, which again tars, ties into uh, Kurt Lewin and it's things like that. And this is other stuff that kind of disappeared from the academy and from research. These ideas just kind of fell off the face of the earth. But you see that this idea that you can change large scale systems by injecting certain things into them, you know, and, and people, as people become, if you have people, you know, they, it's almost like they pass on this insanity. And the same thing when you have these artists, not all of them are agents, but you have someone who's demented, who's, you know, psychologically disturbed, who's, you know, maybe highly ambitious and, and they, and that's a great person to roll out because you're, you're, you're inculcating this person's experience, their madness, their hatred, their whatever it is that they experience that they're channeling into this music that operates on the listeners. You know, not necessarily they're an agent, but you know, you get people that fulfill these functions because they're just that way. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure. On on some levels, some of them aren't going to be willing knowing agents, but then again, many of them are. It's like that quote, uh, from uh, let me just pull it up here from Timothy Leary. People freak out when you read this quote, but uh, so let's see here. If we just type in witting into the search, yes, he answered strongly. I was a witting agent of the CIA. So you worked for the C Central Intelligence Agency, I asked. Is it the deputy director of plans you work for? Who makes your checks? It's none of your business to know how those things work i'll answer no questions that have to do with business i'll answer you any questions about history or people and of course this is walter boert agent interviewing timothy leary agent yes he was a witting agent of the cia and there's you know more than once that he admits it here's another one tim leary all right our undercover agents in los angeles and he's referring to ken kesey the merry pranksters at all, all the Grateful Dead people, all the people spreading all the drugs. Yes, they're agents. It's all just social engineering. Laugh it off. You know, don't take your heroes so emotionally or seriously or whatever. They were manufactured for you. It's like, well, you know, people will say, well, why was Leary thrown in jail? Well, you know, there's a separation between what happens with the local cops like down in Orange County at Laguna Beach when he's arrested down there and thrown in, in jail by the Laguna Beach uh, uh, police chief versus the CIA, you know. And, it, you know, and if the, you know, you can't exactly have it all exposed there that, you know, the CIA is peddling all the drugs that the local cops are trying to stop on the streets and everything otherwise the local cops would just go arrest the cia and we'd shut down the cia and the whole thing would be over but there's an obvious separation between what happens on the local level and with you know getting arrested and leary spending time in slow san luis obispo prison which was minimum security and the whole nonsense story of him hand over fisting his way out on the uh, on the cable over the fence and then you have uh 
you know, the, the weathermen there to pick him up and drive him off so that he can be whisked off to meet other agents like uh, Joanna Harcourt Smith, you know, whatnot, and uh, Europe who rescued him out of Tanzania or wherever the hell he was. But with uh, Grover Cleveland and and all these people, but you know, and, and all of these people are agents on different level. This is you know their involvement. They they're the social engineers. They sell the stuff. This this is what Aldous Huxley and Ken Kesey and Allen Ginsberg and all these people. That's how they operate. And you know, and it, whether it's your music heroes, Jim Morrison or or Jerry Garcia or you know, whomever, Ozzy Osbourne is another one. I mean, Ozzy Osbourne may be too blasted out of his mind to be one, but he's probably one too. He's certainly satanic enough to be one, and I personally don't find any difference between the occult and the intelligence community. They overlap so much, it's hard to even peel them apart. So anyway, there's my rant for the evening. Uh, thanks, man. That was a good rant. <laughs> i enjoyed it you know i was i was i was thinking man i got a rant too but you i got a rant you okay well why don't you rant you know sanchez you know. Has, sanchez in the chat he rants on uh, morrissey it's really good stuff people you got to go into sanchez's channel and watch his his morrissey rant it's hilarious morrissey is such a soy boy it's you know beta soy boy it's ridiculous you know oh have you seen this this parody of henry rollins no, it's, it, this guy's like I'm Henry Rollins, and it's it is so funny. Um, you should play this. It is it's super funny. I'll send it to you. Th All that'll right, yeah. It's just it's it's real short, but um, you know. And are you do you want to play it right now, or is it for another time? Uh, you can just put, I'll just I'll send you the link. It is a good way to close. Where, uh, where are you sending it to? Email or in here? I'll send you in there. Uh, let's see, it's parody. If I could, maybe it's down. It, it's really funny though. Um, but, uh, you know, and people please support and donate. I don't think there's even been any donations for like a half an hour now. We really appreciate all your support and love and kindness and generosity. And, uh, you know, it helps uh, cover the bills while we're doing research and gathering all the books and information and whatnot we have to do to cover all of this stuff. Um, somebody was saying we should rewind the last five minutes. Rewind. Incredible primary sources. Oh, oh, regarding uh, Leary and whatnot. But uh, yeah, you know, it's the same with, uh, you know, McKenna. You know, McKenna, it's like, you know, people will cite Dennis McKenna, who's also dirty and spins everything. And people will cite Dennis McKenna's attack on me at the Free Your Mind conference, no less, which was a total setup. And, you know, of Dennis saying, Jan's low on his meds, you know, and, you know, Terrence wasn't a part of the CIA, maybe the, the galactic central intelligence, agent, you know, something like this. But, you know, it's like, look, folks, you know, I mean, these are agents, you know, Terrence McKenna, he was an agent. He says, I had a price on my head by the FBI. I was running out of money. I was at the end of my rope. And then they recruited me and said, you know, at the place with a mouth like yours, whoops, there's an a place for you in our organization. And I've worked in deep background positions about which the less said, the better. And then about 15 years ago, they shifted me into public relations, public relations. What was Gordon Wasson? All these others were either public or social relations. Tim Leary, uh, uh, Ram Dass, all of these guys, they were all social relations out of Harvard, uh, uh, James Fadiman, et cetera. And a lot of the others were public relations. You have the same M.O. behind the scenes. And he says, I've been there to the present, you know, and, you know, people say, well, you know, the mushrooms recruited him. You know, that's that's Dennis McKenna blowing smoke up your ass, folks. You know, that's him covering his own ass because he's making money off of this stuff. But mushrooms don't have organizations or deep background, uh, deep background positions, et cetera. You know, spy agencies do. You know, mushrooms don't need public relations. You know, that's what spy agencies do. Mushrooms, you know, w wouldn't tell them the less said the better about deep background positions. That's what intelligence agency, uh, agencies do. And the mushrooms aren't able to pay him because he's out of money and on the run for selling drugs and smuggling. And in fact, you know, that's what the CIA and these organizations recruit for. Hey, you know, you're a smuggler, you're overseas, you're doing all this stuff. Be one of our mules and carry stuff. And then uh, are the mushrooms able to get him out of trouble with Interpol and the FBI for drug smuggling? Or is that something 
an agency like the CIA, CIA or FBI could do. You know, and it's like if you go into the brain database, you know, these people that go off on me about Terrence not being uh, in just a second. I just want to pull this up again. Uh, Terrence not being CIA and an agent. What the heck? Up? What happened? Did my program freeze here? Ah, uh, don't tell me the stupid brain just froze on me. Uh, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, Jan, by the way, I'll just, um, I'll just, I'll play that, that, that clip. It's okay. Only, yeah. Go it, ahead while you're doing that and I'll relaunch the yeah. brain. And you you can put up a picture of uh, Henry Rollins if you want. While I play it, everyone knows he's with, from, with back black flag. Um, we have the whole punk movement. A lot of people coming out of DC, um, all kinds of interesting uh, connections there. And I could go on and on. Um, but uh so if, if you're familiar with Henry Rollins, you know how he went from punk rocker to, well, I, I just, I just, it, it makes me smile and I need to smile occasionally. So, uh, wait, where is it? Henry Lawrence Garfield Rollins. I mean, Lawrence Garfield, he's from the Garfield family. Rollins. Okay, hold on, so here it goes. All right, here we go. This is a, just a parody again, so. Hey, this is Henry Rollins. I was in a band in the 80s that everybody says they like, but they don't actually listen to. I'm a vegan, man. Can you handle this? Brace yourself, because I'm about to beat you down with my basic bitch political opinions stated with a determined intensity. You won't be able to handle my conventional majority views stated monotonously over some bland hardcore guitar riffs. See, I'm a punk rocker, but I'm old now, old and wise. Being older means I'm smarter, even though none of my positions have changed since I was an edgy teenager. Can you deal with that, America? <laughs> I think masculinity is dumb. That's why I make tough guy faces and lift weights and stuff. I'll kick your ass if you like masculinity. I regularly donate to the Southern Poverty Law Center. I really hate Southern poverty. Hopefully we can wipe it out one day. See, I'm a white guy, but I can't stand white guys. This is a brave, bold statement I shouldn't be making. I might lose friends and social capital for saying it. Sorry if that burst your bubble, honky, but that's just how it's going to be. Homosexuality is natural and normal. Someone has to tell you this, America, and it might as well be me. I can handle the shitstorm that'll follow. I have all those muscles and stuff. So I can afford to declare wholehearted support for the revolutionary policies and cultural mores that have been altered top-down by our elite ruling class. Sorry. You may not have heard this perspective before, so I'm going to lay it out in simple terms. Sodomy feels good, and you should try it. Feels <laughs> are always good, and there's no reason not to do things that feel good. There sure as hell isn't any reason to tell people not to do things that feel good, let alone prevent them from doing things that feel good, even if it gives them AIDS. Conformity <laughs> It's rigor mortis for your soul, and that's why I'm a nonconformist who fully supports every state-supported cultural change that has taken place in the last 30 years. I plan on continuing to push the envelope and fight in the safe space the ruling elites have formed for me within their global power structure. They don't stand a chance. Because guess what? I'm a 53-year-old white man, and I'm single, and I'm not a father. I'm living the dream. And when I die, I'll leave not a trace. Gone forever. Are you man enough to go extinct? <laughs> Didn't think so, loser. Have fun fighting against your genocide, you fragile weaklings. Wow, that is spot on. That's great, man. Wow. Good one. That's really yeah. funny. That's yeah, because well, Henry Rollins uh, went from being a punk rocker to being a spoken word artist. And so... I think I find that quite amusing. So, <laughs> uh, oh, good grief, man. That's that's yeah. that's hilarious. Oh, wow. All right. Well, we're at uh, two hours plus. Um, I need to uh, use the bathroom. We haven't had any uh, uh, generous donations for a while. Uh, please uh, support the show, folks. Logosmedia.com. Dr. Hans Utter, again, is uh, hansutter.com. Please uh, send him uh, love and support as well for all the research and everything. And uh, anyway, have a great evening and great week. And uh, I guess the holidays are going to be up here in about uh, two weeks, so we're going to have to figure out if we're going to be doing uh, some sort of show during the Thanksgiving week or not. I don't know. I may get the heck out of town. But uh, anyway... Yeah, well, I just I thank everybody who's listening and people that listen later. 
uh, I could say in some ways the content in this is a little more advanced because I'm bringing a lot of different things together, uh, but it, it, it does make sense, um, even to Henry Rollins. Uh, but uh, so, but uh, you know, I appreciate again the interest and in, and in this. What I am doing though, to a certain extent, is is showing this stuff where it actually operates, as well as the, some of the theory behind it, why this stuff would be done, how it's deployed. Um, and, you know, whether or not it's deployed or you actually have people that are not just agents, they're zealots, right? They want this revolutionary thing, right? They, they, they are and they are subscribed to this revolution, which the why I like that Henry Rollins thing, right? Of course, what's the revolution led us to this totalitarian, far more oppressive revolutionary oh, yeah. state? Than, uh, than, it, it's, than, it's way more oppressive in the name of freedom than, you know, than it's ever been in my lifetime. And, you know, the CIA and SRI and all the rest would be proud, you know, and 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 all these libtards think that it's actual freedom and they've been given no freedom at all. You know, they don't grasp what freedom really is. And they think that, you know, it's running around high and and fucking buttholes and excuse my French and uh, running down the street with your with your boobies out, you know, that's what they think freedom is. They have no concept, but you know, people uh, apparently don't get what Pearl Jam really means. Pearl White Jam. What is Pearl Jam, folks? They're mocking you. It's not jam like as in music. It's jam like as in jelly and jam. Pearl Jam. Think about it, and you'll figure it out, and uh, get that there's part of the same degeneracy as all the others. So anyway, that's a wrap for me. Anything right. else, Hans? No, I'll just uh, I'll just stay here and stare at my computer with the sound off of people just want to watch me stare. Oh, yeah, you know, that's kind of cool. If you want to do that, I'll just leave it up. I'm going to go take a leak, so I'm going to get yeah. out. No, I'm, I'm going to go to Jan, and so thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks, everybody, for listening. No, it, that's like an Andy Warhol. That's a John Cage piece. I'll just, you know, just stare. All right, man. Good, good night. night. All right, good night. all the best.